Well, today's forecast, or I'm sorry, tomorrow's forecast. God reigns and the sun shines. I want to tell you that a couple things. First is that you've already had a sermon by our brother about the prodigal son. And I thought that was kind of appropriate for today since it is Father's Day. I also want to share with you that when I talk to pastors, which I talk to a lot of them, and I ask them what day we set up a date, and we set up for last Sunday. And it turned out that our pastor was not going to be there, so I had to preach at our church. And so I asked uh, Pastor Nathan if we could change it to this week, because I wanted to be here. Because uh, I want to tell you, I have been a Gideon for 33 years. I have spoken probably over a hundred churches in that time. Uh, you have a keeper here. Yes. And I want to tell you, you want to make sure you keep this guy. Yes. And I mean that. Yes. That's because so many pastors today don't preach the word. No. But I know that he does. Yes. And we're living in a time where we need to hear the word of God. Yes. And so we need to be sure and make sh that we listen to what he's preaching. Um, he made a mistake this morning, not that we don't all make mistakes, and that was is that he said that I could share what was on my heart, and so you're going to get two messages today. <laughs> you're going to get the first one, which is uh, about me and my family. You see, I have two sons since it's Father's Day. I thought this was kind of appropriate. The youngest one... Uh, he worked for British P Petroleum, and he moved 13, well, actually, it's been 18 years ago, he moved to Chicago, and he lived there for 13 years. He had a job with $100,000 a year. He also had a house that was $290,000. He had a wife and our granddaughter. Well, that was great, except for the problem that he got involved with some drugs. And in the process of that, he got arrested. And they got, threw him in jail. And so my wife went, and I went up there to Chicago. And then, so we decided, well, you know, this is a good learning experience. Let's don't bail him out the very first day. Let's leave him in there for another day. So we did. And we bailed him out. And these were his exact words. I'm never going to go back to jail again. What a great opportunity we had to share with him that that's not a good place to be. That was a good idea, but it didn't happen because it wasn't very much longer after that. He got arrested a second time. And this time he was going, the, he was going home from work. He drove 30 miles the wrong way from where he lived. He was driving on the wrong side of the road. So you see what drugs can do to you? And so... He got arrested, thrown in jail. Uh, we got a lawyer. Hey, my name's Bruce. His name was Bruce Stein. Anyway, uh, he, uh, we went to court again. And in the process, they allowed him out. He got out uh, after he'd spent a couple days again in jail. And that would have been the end of the story, but it wasn't. Because they put him in rehabilitation. So they sent him to a kind of a camp where they deal with people on drugs. And all this time, he still has his job. Pretty amazing that he hadn't lost his job. Well, he was to spend a month there. We decided that that's not a, probably long enough. So we paid $17,000 to have them keep him a second month. Well, in the process... He lost his house. So we, while he's going to camp, if you want to call it that, or rehabilitation, we sold some of the stuff in his house. We moved his wife and his daughter to a, an apartment, a duplex, and we did all that while he's gone. He gets out after two months, and he gets a call from his job. And his boss decided... Because there was another lady that was there. He's making 100000 She's making 45000 
and they had to decide which one to keep. They kept him and his job. You talk about an amazing act of God. That was great. So we stayed a couple more days. And we left. We didn't get out of town and we had called back for some reason and he didn't answer the phone. While we were gone, just those couple hours, he drove down to Chicago, bought drugs, came out of Chicago, and had a wreck. Yeah. And so back in jail he went. In the process of that, he ended up with three years in federal prison. Now he did, it's crazy to me, you could take courses and if you took a course, you got whatever, if the course was 60 days, you got 60 days taken off of your, your, your prison term. So he's now uh, actually trained in horticulture. <laughs> and then he took a computer course and that's what he did with his job. And he not only took it, he ended up teaching most of it because he knew more than the teacher did. So he got out after a year and a half, moved back home with his wife, Lived there for a year, but he never got a job. Started drinking. He gave up the drugs, but he was now drinking. And so he takes out one, you know, the Bible says if you clean your house, maybe seven spirits return instead of the one that you kicked out. Well, he lived there for a year, and we finally talked him into this is not working. And so he came and lived with us. Well... By this time, we had spent $100,000 on him between lawyers, between going to rehabilitation and be paying off his bills and pay, helping his wife out. And so he lived with us, and we got him a job. It was funny, though, because he didn't have a driver's license. He still doesn't have a driver's license. It's crazy because in Illinois... He can get a driver's license if he lives there and has a job. But Iowa will not recognize the fact that they'll give him a license. And so he has tried three times to get them to okay to get a license here in Iowa from Illinois. And they haven't done it yet. And that's been five years ago when all that process took place. So he lived with us and he started out... Uh, he had a job and he's doing okay. He had a bike. We only live four, four, uh, four blocks from where he worked. So sometimes I took him, sometimes he rode the bike. And it probably wasn't a month later, he went down to the quick trip, bought some beer, got drunk. I think he was taking some uh, prescription drugs. You can't drink and take prescription drugs. So he got drunk and the police picked him up, said, if you'll come get him, Take him home, that's okay. So I got ready to go pick him up. They called back again, said, you better come get him now because we got another call. If you don't get him, then we're going to have to arrest him. So I went and met him, and he was out of his mind, literally. He didn't know where he was at. He didn't know what he was doing. That just shows you what happens when you get involved with these kind of things. They stole his bike while he was gone. <laughs> The next day we went back, the bike was gone. So now he doesn't have it. So I had to walk to work part of the time. We took him most of the time. And the good news is, is that he kind of got off of the drugs. He got off of the alcohol. And so we're heading in the right direction. Yes, amen. Then he got hooked on gambling. You talk about the prodigal son and the father. Yeah. Uh, we've been through that several times. So we paid off his gambling debts. In about two weeks, he $3,000 in debt. So we paid all those off. He went out and got some more debt. So this time, I forgot to tell you one of the interesting things was, though, that when I brought him home from the gas station, I gave him a note. I said, you've got two choices. You can move out in two weeks, or you've got, you got to go to uh, the White House, they call it, which is a drug place where all these guys are rehabilitating. And, and uh, so he stayed with us and went. we took him four days a week. I have a nephew down in Florida who goes six days a week. That's how strong drugs can be. 
and we just don't understand just how bad that can be on us. The good news is he's had a job now for five years. He's doing good. And so, you know, as a father, uh, we've spent a hundred and almost twenty thousand dollars now to try to get him through all of this. Uh, I don't recommend it because we are an enabler, they call it. The bad news is that you lose the money, but the good news is that right now it's all worth it. Yes. I share that story with you only because I think all of us are affected in one way or another. It doesn't have to be you. It can be a son. It can be a grandson. It can be a friend. It can be a, a neighbor. We all are, uh, are faced with this kind of thing. And so I just want to know, let you know there is hope at the end of the light, yes. you know, at the end yes. of the tunnel. Amen. And so we all have that opportunity to remember that God's in control. Yes. And we just have to keep the faith. Yes. Amen. Well, I really came here to share with you about the Gideons. So let me share with you a little bit about the Gideons. The Gideons are, of course, an organization. We have one goal and one vision. We're from all kinds of different churches, but... Our one goal and one vision is to win, win men and women and boys and girls to Jesus Christ. Yes. That's it. We don't have anything else. That's our goal. That's our focus. And we do that by distributing Bibles. Last year, in April, we have what's called a blitz. And in that blitz, we went to all the hotels, replaced all the Bibles. We went to some of the schools, gave out Bibles. At the schools, when the kids get out, we stand on the sidewalk and we just ask them, would you like a free copy? Would you like a free Bible? And we pass those out at the schools. We also, uh, in that blitz, went to nursing homes. Uh, we went to, one of the first times, to the lawyer's offices. And we placed Bibles there if they wanted one. So we gave out 35,000 Bibles in four days. Wow. But I want to share with you a little bit of another type of blitz. In 1997, I went to India. And I've been here before, and I believe I shared some of that with you. We gave out 185,000 Bibles in two weeks. Well, in 2017, I had the opportunity to go again. And this time, I went to Argentina. Now, the good news is that we gave out 194,000 Bibles. Bad news is, I don't speak Spanish. So we did have an interpreter with us. Diane was my interpreter. That was the good news. The bad news is we were downtown on the corner. I'm on this corner. She's on that corner. And so I learned enough to ask people, would you like a free Bible? You know, and that was about the extent of it. I was in good shape as long as they took the Bible and one it went on. But when they started talking to me, I was totally lost. But... We had a great time during that time. I spoke in three different churches while I was down there. And that's part of the ministry is when you go, you, you have a chance to speak in some of these other. And of course, some of them uh, had translators and some of them did English. So as we're down there, they have a university down there with 100,000 students. It's because it's free. And that's why so many come to Cordova because they have this free university. So we gave out Bibles there four days. As a matter of fact, we went back one night and uh, gave out Bibles at night. The interesting thing is they have stop signs, uh, but nobody stops. <laughs> they have no parking signs, but everybody parks on the university. And I was with a highway patrolman. I was assigned with him most of the time. And we come up to a stoplight, like you would here, and the light changes yellow. If nobody's coming, you don't wait for it to turn green. He turns. He goes straight. He goes right on through the light. But we had a, an opportunity to go to several different areas. We do distributions in Argentina just like we do them here in the United States. We went to the schools. Some of them, of course, are, are private schools. We could go right in and talk to the kids. And I would go in and I would say to them, uh, how many of you in here have ever told a lie? And of course, all the hands go up, including the teachers. I thought that was interesting. They even put their hands up. And I said, you know, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we need 
to, we're going to give you this little Bible. And this little Bible tells you about Jesus. And Jesus is the one that can take away those sins. Yeah. And so we gave out Bibles. It was interesting because in some of the, the schools, the parents bring the kids. So we gave out Bibles outside to the parents. And then we went into the classrooms and gave the Bibles out to the kids. Now, at a public school, we were not allowed in the schools. So they are, matter of fact, we're getting pretty close to that here. If you go to a school now, there's only one entrance. And you have to check in. Well, that's the way it is there. There's only one entrance. That's the good news because we get them coming out and we get them going in. And that's because they have a, half the kids go in the daytime and the morning and half of them go in the afternoon. So we would get there. We would get the ones coming out and give them a little testament like this. And then we would get the ones that are going in at the same time. So we had a chance to give out Bibles at both both sites, yeah. both times. And so we do that with the local Gideons there. It's not just, there were 10 of us from different countries, and then there was uh, the local Gideons. And we would talk about prayer. One of the things, because this is the second blitz I've been on, when we get up in the morning, we go down, and the first thing we do is have prayer. We would do prayer from five to six. And then at six, we would go have breakfast, and then we would meet with the local Gideons and we would go out and give out Bibles. And Argentina, Cordoba, is pretty much a, similar to the, the United States. If you were driving through the city, you wouldn't really notice any major differences. In India, you would because they're very poor over there and their housing is terrible. <coughs> Believe me, most of them, a lot of them live in tents. Some of them just live on the street. But in Cordoba, it's similar to the United States. So... We would go out and give out these Bibles in different areas. We went to a hospital while we were there. I did not go with this group, but I want to show you how much prayer makes a difference. When I say that, we're not only praying, but we have people around the world to pray for these blitzes. And so there are 275,000 men and women who volunteer their time. But we have 275,000 people that are praying for us. So the Gideons went to this military camp and said, we want to know if we can give, your, give Bibles out here. There's 5,000 people in the military. And the general said, well, you can do it, but you'll have to come back. Come back in a couple hours. So they left and came back two hours later. Where they were parked, the first time they went there, there was a car there. There was also a tree that had fallen over on that car. So God protected those people because of that. So we gave out, they gave out 5,000 Bibles there at that, at that uh, town where the military was at. So we gave out Bibles uh, in all those different areas just like we do here. And we have a chance to, uh, we went to the hospitals. Uh, these are Bibles that we give out in the hospitals. Matter of fact, this is a little Spanish Bible. And uh, a lot of the Bibles we gave out some were in English and some were in Spanish. And so we had a chance to give out Bibles there as well. The uh, other thing is we came back through uh, Chile when we flew back and we were in Santiago. We flew down through there. Actually, I flew to Atlanta, then down to Santiago and then down to Cordova. We came back and uh, most of us, uh, several were from the States. We came back to Cordova and two weeks after we got back, there was an 8.4 earthquake in Cordova. So we were just that close to being involved with some of that. You never know what God has, but God has protection, I believe. We, tr we pray for travel mercies. Uh, that's very important, especially when you think of the number of people that are killed right here on the highways in Iowa. So we can't take things for granted. So we give out Bibles. Last year we gave out 91 million Bibles. Yep. And we continue, matter of fact, uh, just about a year and a half ago we gave out the two billionth Bible. Do you know there's seven billion people in the world and so our work isn't done. We continue to give out Bibles. And Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word go forth. It shall not return void but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper 
and the things for which I sent it. Yes. We give out those testaments believing that they do not return void. That's God right. touches hearts. We hear testimonies all of the time about people who get saved. One of the teams, there was a guy going to commit suicide. Luckily, it was a team that spoke Spanish, the, the Gideons from the local Gideons, and so they shared about Jesus with him. I don't know if he accepted Jesus, but he did not commit suicide. And so if nothing else, right. you know, how much, how, if we went down there and one person got saved, right. was it worth it? Yeah. Yes. We, we think it is. Yes. And so we, it's not a time that's wasted. It's a time that we use to honor God with what he has allowed us to do. Yes. So this ministry, uh, and I've shared this testimony and uh, I'll share it again, only because it's one of my favorites. It's about George LeMaster. And maybe you remember this testimony, maybe you don't. If you get to be my age, you probably don't. <laughs> George LeMaster was an alcoholic, he had been. He came to Des Moines to a pastor's banquet and shared this personally. That's one of the reasons I like it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, he was an alcoholic. He had been an alcoholic for 20 years. And he got thrown in jail several times. And this time, on this occasion, his wife came to the prison or jail and said, George, she said, I can't take this anymore. You're going to have to choose between me and the bottle. He said, I looked her right in the eye and he said, I choose the bottle. She left. She was going to get a divorce. And George got out a couple days later and he decided that his life really wasn't worth much. And so he went out to the dump because he figured his life was just as bad as the trash. He got a gun and he went out, walked around to the back of the dump, got the gun out, and just as he started to put the gun up to his head, he said he saw a little testament laying on the ground that caught his eyes. He picked that up. He said, I read from the book of James and I found that Jesus loved me. He put the gun away. He went back home finished reading the book of James and he said, Lord, he said, whatever you decide, I'm willing to serve you. And he is a pastor in two churches in Wayland, Missouri. Yeah. We got to believe that God yes. is still in the save solely yes. business. Yes. Yes. Amen. That's what the Gideons are all about. We see people that get saved all the time. And we have that opportunity to be a part of that. You know, I, we're going to go, let's see if I brought one. It doesn't make any difference. It's a green a Bible. I think I left it over there. It doesn't matter. It's a little green testament. The, every year we go to Iowa, Iowa State, UNI. And we give out about five to 6,000 at Iowa and Iowa State. And we give out about 3,000 at UNI. And we go to other universities, like right here in Des Moines, we go to Grandview, I also go down to Simpson, and we have a chance to give out Bibles. And we just, same thing, would you like a free testament? And they get the word, but I believe I get blessed. Because I had the opportunity to give that to someone. Amen. And what, how much more can we be blessed than that? Giving God's word to somebody. And if if we have time, we, you know, it's, it's interesting. We're not allowed to preach to the kids. Now, you might think that's kind of strange. Yeah. Well, the reason is, okay, I'm over here talking to Bill, and I'm telling him about this little testament. While I'm talking to Bill, 25 kids just walk by me. Bill might have got a Bible, might have got to heard a little bit about God, but I just missed 25 kids that had a chance to receive a testament. Yeah. One of the neat things, and let me look, I don't, one of the neat things, because technology is the big thing today, yeah. right? The new Bibles that we now print on the inside have a Bible app. And you can download that Bible app on your phone. So if you have a smartphone, an iPhone, you take that out, you can download that app, and on that app, is 1,200 languages. Wow. 1,200. 200 of those languages you can pull up and it'll actually talk to you in that language. So that's kind of a neat thing because we have so many people that are from other countries and so if you've got somebody from Russia, I don't speak Russian, but I can show that uh, app to them and I can bring that up and they can read the Bible right there on that app. Yeah. 
So it's a new technology thing that is really going to make a difference, I think, uh, with 1,200 different languages. And so if, yeah, I encourage you, if you want to do that, you can do it on your phone real easily. And you can get it at, in different versions. If you want it in the King James, you want it in New Modern King James, ESV, and there's probably some other ones besides. You can download that, and then you can look up the country and look up and get that language. So that's a neat thing. A little testament like that costs a dollar twenty-five in another country. We pay it's a dollar thirty-five in the United States. One of the things is that's neat about it is is that we have people in other countries. We do not have to teach them the language because we're in two hundred countries. We don't have to find a place for them to live, and we don't have to teach them the culture or the food that you might eat or not eat. <laughs> so. That's a great opportunity because they become an extension of the church in those countries by giving out Bibles. And so we don't have to ship the Bibles. If you've ever mailed anything overseas, you'll understand what I'm saying. Can you imagine what it would cost to mail just 25 full Bibles like this? I'm going to tell you, it weighs about 40 pounds, that box does. And if you had to mail it from the United States, we'd pay more for, in postage than the five dollars it does for the Bible. Yeah. So we have an opportunity. When I said we took all those Bibles out of the hotels, they're still used. We can take the cover off, put a soft cover on it, and they're given out in the prisons. We also can take them to the battered shelters. And we can also take them to some of the other places that uh, with those used Bibles. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to share with you about this ministry, but it's also if you want to be a part of this, 100% of what you give goes for Bibles. How many times have you had a telemarketer call you? Just ask him. If I give $10, how much of that goes to what you're actually asking? If you're lucky, $6. Sometimes only $4. They get the rest. And the Gideons have always been that way since I joined, and they're still that way. 100% goes for Bibles. The more Bibles we believe, the more souls for the kingdom of God. I'll share one last testimony with you. That's about Diane. Diane uh, was in uh, high school, and the Gideons were on the sidewalk. And when she went out, she got one of these little testaments. She took it home, but you know, she lived in a house, and they were all atheists. But she would get this little testament at night, and she would read it. Well, she didn't find the Lord through that testament. But she went off to college and met a girl there that was a Christian girl that led her to the Lord. But she said in her testimony, that wasn't the end of it. You see, when she went off to college, her mom went in to clean the room. And in the bedroom, on the shelf, in the closet, was a little Gideon testament. And she found that testament, and the mother read it and got saved. She was able to sign her name in the back of the book. Say that prayer and say and say that and sign her name. And so Diane says now, she says, we have two Christians in a house full of atheists. But I'm sure between her and her mother that they've been working on them, you know, sharing the word of God when they have that opportunity and that time. And so there may be more in the family today. Yes. That's what it's all about. Yes. Saving souls. Yes. Thank you, and God bless you. We're going to be going to uh, the doctors and dentist offices, the auxiliary does, in September, and they give out these little white testaments, and that's all across the city of Des Moines. There's four camps, and each camp goes to each of those places. We go every year. You know, it's interesting because uh, I drive my wife, and she'll go in and say, would you like, you know, some testaments? Mm -hmm. And they'll say no. Next year we go back, there's somebody else different at the desk. Would you like some testaments? Yes. So we don't give up on these people. We continue to put them there. And then we put a, a large print in the waiting room if they'll take it, along with the full Bible. And so that's a great opportunity for us to give out Bibles. We do that every year. And we added veterinarian offices. And I was surprised... Almost all of them take Bibles yeah. and 
for the office and stuff. So we're always looking for different opportunities to give out Bibles. Amen. Okay, Toby and uh, John, could you would you fellas uh, take up the offering here for the Gideons? Father, we just ask you to bless this and increase it and use it for the glory of God and for the word of God to be spread anywhere and everywhere. Amen. God bless the Gideons and their effort to bring you into reality in the lives of people all over the world. Yes. In Jesus' name, give as unto the Lord. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Well, since it's just after 11, and I did say last week I would speak, I will. And I'll... And I'll try to be as, if I can't be brief, I'll be fast. <laughs> so you'll have to listen quickly, praise God. Let me, but before we do that, just as a little transition here while they're putting the offering up, do um, you know where to find a cow with no legs? Anybody? Ground right where you left him. <laughs> no legs, right? Did you hear about the Italian chef that died? He passed away. Pasta. They only get worse, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because it'll only be better from here on. If you're thinking about singing karaoke with a friend, just do it. <laughs> Woman walks into the library, asks if there are any books on paranoia, and the librarian says they're right behind you. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it until somebody laughs, so. We are. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Never mind. My hearing is not that good. I thought about uh, having my spine removed because I feel like it's just holding me back. <laughs> okay, enough nonsense. Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to talk about a few things here, and when we do, I want you to be thinking Christianity because we're talking basically Judaism, Old Testament, but we're still talking Christianity here, and that's where we want to keep the focus because everything in here is prophetic. It's God trying to reveal himself and his plan and his purpose for man. And he does that from the very beginning, yes, even yes. before there's Judaism. He does it through Abraham and through, through prophets and so on and so forth throughout the scriptures. But uh, he's trying to get one message across and that he's God and he's the one that can save us. And our focus on him will make all the difference in the world. So in the Old Testament, it's many times we know this, it's Jesus concealed or hidden. But in the New Testament, it's Jesus revealed yes. with clarity. So yes. Jesus is all the way through this, all the way back to the Word was with God, the Word was God. Right. And he said, right, and it was. So this is, we're, we're seeing Jesus revealed throughout the Bible. It's just that in, under the Old Covenant, it's not an open revelation. Right. It's kind of a, a, a hidden secret, amen. So it comes with clarity. So uh, that's what we want to do. We want to see that not only does the Word reveal God, it reveals us. Yeah. Remember Jesus in, in, in Luke 4, he said, uh, he looked through the scriptures, actually went to Isaiah 61, I think it was 62, and uh, of course there wasn't a 61 or 62 then, but there was an Isaiah to the scroll, and he says he found himself yes. in the scripture. Now this is a man. I mean, he's filled with God, but he is a man. He's the son of man. Yes. And so that's why we can find ourselves too. As Christians, you can find yourself in this book. It's talking to us about us and about our God, okay? So let's begin here with Hebrews chapter 10, and, I, and I'd like to read verses uh, 7 through 10, Suzanne. He, Hebrews 10, verses 7 through 10. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will. To do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, once and for all. Praise the Lord. So he says the, the law 
had no way to save you. It would show you your, your need of a savior, but it couldn't save you. So the second is better than the first because when Jesus comes, he fulfills the law so that now we can be saved. Right? All right, let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So, praise the Lord. The book of Exodus tells us about the story of this long, uh, wandering uh, people of Israel uh, who end up being enslaved for 430 years in Egypt until God would send this stuttering prophet, amen, by the name of Moses, who was afraid to speak, who didn't want to get, knew that people would laugh at him and mock him probably for doing it, but God said, no, you're the guy, because I am, you will do it. Yeah. And so he does. And so he comes to lead them out in this dramatic escape to uh, get out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. So that Red Sea crossing became the historical moment of salvation for Israel. It's the thing they always look back to whenever they're talking about how they were, how God delivered them and so on and so forth. So the Jews of Jesus' day look back to the Exodus in a similar way that Christians today look back to the crucifixion. It was their deliverance time. It was their moment, amen, in history where God showed up. It was the, the watershed moment of redemption, the moment of God's faithfulness, his intervention, his intervention into time where God actually shows up in our space and time. Amen. We know God is not in time. He's eternal. And he's not spacious in the way we think of space because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere and all the time with me, but he's everywhere else at the same time. So it's just hard concepts for us to understand in that way. But Israel always looked back to the Exodus as the moment when God's covenant and faithfulness to that covenant invaded human history, became a reality, became something we could look back to even to this day. Amen. And moreover, the children of Israel saw the Exodus event as a promise of salvation yet to be completed. They knew that there was prophetic words speaking of a Jesus that would come and save them, a Messiah that would come and totally deliver them. Amen. And so it was a dramatic redemption for sure. But... It was also a down payment of sorts, amen, on the redemption that was yet to come. Yeah. All right, so after their escape, they go to the wilderness and they wander there for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Moses led them right up to the very cusp of, of the uh, promised land before he died. And then the leadership is passed over to Joshua, who then took over and led Israel across the Jordan River into Canaan. Now, that led to a long, multi-generational history of spiritual adultery, cheating on God at every turn. Their lack of faithfulness to believe God is actually the recurring theme of the Old Testament. It talks more about them failing and not believing God and not trusting God and not believing that He would do what He said He would do than there is anything else. And so the nation that God favored, the people that He called His people, compromised themselves with the nations that were around them. We talked about this last week with much of the way the, the, uh, the government, even in this country now, is forcing or at least uh, uh, imposing certain beliefs on people. You don't have to believe it, but you have to abide by it. Yeah. It's wrong. And this is the same, same situation Israel found itself in. All over any place they went, they ended up absorbing the culture that they were in rather than exposing the culture to themselves or to their, to their God. They, they became a sponge instead of releasing God. They, they were receiving yeah. idolatry and, and, and lies and, and so on and so forth. So by the end of the Old Testament, Israel is living in the land of their alleged deliverance. And it's again waiting for deliverance. Yes. I mean, this is so Christian. They're delivered from sin and the penalty for it but they're compromising their faith in God's promises by comparing themselves with the culture around them or trying to be like the culture that they're in. Amen. 
It's secular humanism. This is not, I mean, I know we're a Christian country, but it's a far cry from the Christian country that I grew up in 50 years ago or more. So we can't kid ourselves anymore. We're in a world, but we're not of the world. And it's never, it's never been more obvious, I don't think, than it is today. We're to take dominion. Yes, Wherever we step, it ought to be an extension of the kingdom of God. That's what, that's what Bruce is talking about. When they go to Argentina, when they go to India, when they go wherever they go, they're, they're taking the kingdom to those places that are in darkness. They're bringing the light of the gospel to a dark world. And so that's what this is all about. It's important, amen, that uh, we not compromise with unbelief. It's a challenge. I mean, I can imagine. We've all been through things. What Bruce talking about with his son. Listen, it's hard sometimes to just say, God, I believe that me and my house will be saved, that we will be prospered, that we will be protected. When all of the evidence around you is telling you something else. But I also know the Isaiah scripture that Bruce quoted, and that is that his word will not come back void. If he can find somebody that will speak it back or that will share it, Amen. Then it will accomplish whatever the purpose was for it to accomplish. And that's that's the word of God. Now, come on. We either believe this or we're all wasting our time here today. Amen. That's that's the truth. Praise the Lord. So when the New Testament opens, then the promised land is under the dominion of the Roman Empire. Amen. Here's the point. If we don't occupy, somebody's going to. And when Israel didn't occupy the promised land, they ended up being occupied. Now, we have to occupy or get occupied. That's just how simple it is. It's not complicated. It's just a question of either believing and acting on what God says or suffering the consequences. Praise the Lord. Jews are living under Roman rule and their occupation, and they're longing for God to intervene and deliver them again. Praise the Lord. They, They always expected this deliverance would happen. But they expected that it would occur in the wilderness, in the Jordan River Valley, the same place that God had brought them ages before in the days of Moses and Joshua. And for that reason, during the time of the Roman occupation, the Jews would go out into the wilderness and they would start communes or they would start a small militia or army, you know, the Essenes and the the Maccabees and different ones throughout uh, further back in history as well. Amen. And eventually there would be a skirmish or a battle. And every would-be Messiah or military leader hoping to pay the way for a Messiah would wind up dead. Usually crucified because that was the typical uh, you know, punishment for ins- insurrectionists. But the followers of God kept trying. Trying to get delivered. But they were trying to deliver themselves. And so look at Isaiah chapter 40, and we'll read verses 3 through 5. Isaiah 40, uh, 3 through 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. Verses uh, 9 and 10. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. O Zion that bringest good tidings. Get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringest good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah. Behold your God. Behold the Lord will come with strong hand. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Now, the conventional thinking then, when Israel would look at the scroll of Isaiah and read this in the days of Jesus, the conventional thinking was the way of the Lord is prepared. His revealing or his inauguration began in the wilderness. So the expectation began in the wilderness too. In other words, that's where he did it the first time. We're expecting him to do it there again. He's going to deliver us, and that's where it's going to happen. Yeah. Is in the wilderness, right? So by the time Jesus was in his late 20s or early 30s, his cousin John had gone to the wilderness with the expectation that the Messiah would come in from the wilderness. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I'm not 
giving you all kinds of scriptures here because we've been hearing these stories since Sunday school. But instead of starting a commune or a, a military group and finding a bunch of angry guys with swords that would bust some Roman heads, he just put on camel hair coat and stood in the river. A little unusual compared to what the normal kind of behavior had been. Okay, So John was baptizing. He was submerging people in the Jordan River. Yep. He was a product of the wilderness, eating, uh, you know, wild honey and locusts. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever tried to eat wild honey. That would be a good reason for wearing a camel hair coat because there's bees all over the honey. Yeah. And they don't just give it up because you want wild honey. So it was a little bit uh, different than what we may think of it. Amen. So here he is. He's out there expecting... And declaring again the arrival of God's intervention in human history to rescue and redeem his people. He did it by going to the place of the entrance to the promised land and getting people wet, baptizing them, taking them through the river. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now he's talking about Jews. This gospel was preached to them from the old covenant. Yeah. Right? It, Jesus was hidden in there, but they didn't have faith. They didn't exercise faith with it. They believe it when they heard it, and then they just wander off into whatever other stuff they were going to do and, and find themselves in a big mess and then have to get delivered again and looking for God over and over and over. Anybody yeah. say amen to that? You ever had yeah. a problem? Yeah. So, for which we have believed to enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all of his work. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest. So the main, the main thrust of Christian baptism is repentance. Amen? Turning from one thing to another. From one way of thinking to another way of thinking. Moving from one place or one position to another position. John was, in essence, recreating the exodus. He was doing it on a spiritual plane, but he was recreating the exodus. He's in the same location, basically, and with the same uh, kind of motivation. Yeah. Amen. He did it in the same river yeah. that divided the wilderness from the wandering Jews from the land of promise. Uh -huh. Amen. And he was saying God is about to do some new thing. Yeah. Amen. God is about to bring his deliverance. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Whatever your situation Whatever your circumstance is today, if you'll go back to what saved you originally, if you'll go back to faith in God's word, to faith in God's promise, he'll deliver you again. He'll deliver you every time you go back to the word of God, back to his promise, back to his truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn away from everything, any other way of seeking for God's kingdom and do this. Praise the Lord, because God is coming again. Right now. Yes. Hallelujah. If you believe. He can come into your life. He can come into your heart. He can come into your world. Praise the Lord. And he will literally come again. I believe when we begin to preach this gospel to all the world. Amen. When everybody gets a chance for a Bible. When everybody gets an opportunity to hear the word of God. He'll show up. In the meantime, he'll show up in us. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen. Behold, I send my messenger, right? Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 9 through 15. Mark 1, 9 through 15. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Mm -hmm. 
And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. I mean, are you seeing the parallels here? Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Being tempted and falling prey to the temptation. Jesus is going through the wilderness for 40 days and being tempted by the devil, but he doesn't submit to it. He doesn't give in to it. He doesn't yield to it. Praise the Lord. Now, after that, John was put in prison and Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Amen. Enter into his rest. Yes. The finished work is his rest. It's yes. entering into him. Amen. <laughs> Let's not make the same mistake Israel made no. and just keep wandering. Right. When there is a promised land. Yes. Amen. There yes. is a, But you got to go. you got to go into it and believe that God is there ahead of you yes. to take care of the enemies. Amen. Yes. That are in that place. Hosea yes. chapter 2. Uh, and we'll read verse 14 through 23. Hosea 2 and 14 through 23. Years ago, I preached a message uh, about from this very text. And uh, it's God tempting us into the wilderness. Drawing us into a place of repentance. Into a place where we can connect with the Lord. Amen. So therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. It sounds like a, a contradiction, really. That why, would you, why would someone want to allure you and draw you in? To a wilderness. Because that's where God's going to do this new thing. Amen. Yeah. Into the wilderness to speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence. And the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Eshai, and shalt call me no more Baalai. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall be no more re be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down and safely. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Now he's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about us. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, it wasn't happening the way so many people expected. No swords. No weapons. Hey, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, yes. but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen. Yes. Amen. So instead, they wielded something far more dangerous, something far more powerful, the word of God, yes. the sword of the spirit. Yeah. Hallelujah. The radical message of Jesus Christ. Yes. God has come in the yes. flesh and his kingdom is at hand. Yes. Praise the Lord. See, the crucial truth at work is that something we need to remember. Every, every step along the journey, amen, of our spiritual existence, and that is that God keeps his promises, yes. but he does it in unexpected ways. Amen. Just as Bruce was talking about amen. earlier. Yes. Can't expect him to be cookie-cuttered. No. He can do the same thing, but he can do it a million different ways. Yes. So you can't predetermine how God's going to do it. Exactly. You can just predetermine that he will do it. But he'll do it his way. Praise the Lord. So let's look at this Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 16 through 22. It came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And this is speaking of Jesus. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now remember, these are the people that are under Roman control that are looking for a deliverer to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 
And he closed the book and he gave it back to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which he pre that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Isn't this Joseph's kid? So there's no way they're thinking he can be the Messiah. There's no way he can be the fulfillment of the scripture. Amen. He's the kid that lived down the street. We know we're not even sure if he's legitimate. Yeah. And there were rumors going around back then that they weren't even really married yet. And, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So how there's no way he can be the fulfillment of liberty to captives. Right. And yet he was. Yeah. And he is. Yes. They couldn't see Jesus as the fulfillment of the promise of. And the reason they couldn't, because as long as they were thinking of liberty in one way and God was thinking of it in another way, they weren't ever going to experience it. But whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we believe the work of salvation has been done by Jesus Christ. That's what we believe as Christians. Amen. And we can't get into the kingdom by our own efforts. Jesus earned our way in for us. Truth is... It can be difficult to live as though it's a finished work. Right. It takes faith. It does. It does. You have to believe what the Word of God says. Yes. Faith is belief in action or belief acted on. Uh -huh. So you can't have, uh, I don't know, sedentary faith. You can't have faith that doesn't move you to do something or to respond mm -hmm. to the Word of God. If you did, it wouldn't be faith. Right. So imagine Jews are thinking this wannabe Messiah is claiming the authority over the law. Now, the law is all they knew. Yep. Amen. The fulfillment of the law is what he was claiming to be. Yep. Right. The law is good, but the law can't save you. No, that's right. It can just show what a mess you are yes. and how much you need a Savior. Amen. So Jesus is the promise of salvation. Yes. Christ's life itself is a promise yes. to you and me. Yes. New life. Life in the kingdom. The promised land. Yes. God is the source there. The supply there. The protection there. The provision there. The Savior there. Uh -huh. Last scripture here. Joshua chapter 3 verses 10 and 11. Yeah, maybe not the last scripture, but it'll be close. <laughs> uh, and Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and any otherites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth before you into Jordan. So the first 40-year generation led by Moses and Joshua they saw the children of Israel cross over the Jordan River, yep. and they did it by focusing on the ark that was carried by the priest. Yep. Yes. Amen. How many of you know if you're born again, you are a king yep. and a priest? Yes. Praise the Lord. So the ark opened the Jordan River and let them cross over into physical promised land. Yep. Yes. It rolled, the scripture says it rolled the water all the way back to the city of Adam. Yes. So in other words, all the way back to God's first man. To God's original purpose. Still, it's, it's ongoing. They, they thought he changed his plan. He didn't change his plan. It's the same plan he had from the beginning. That man would be redeemed. And that God would live in this earth in humanity. Praise the Lord. So John the Baptist, he carried the ark, the real ark, when he baptized Jesus in the Jordan. Amen. And that showed us the way to the real promised land. Was through identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The promised land this time is not a place. It's not a piece of real estate. The promised land is, in fact, Jesus Christ himself. He is your provider. He's your provision. He's your savior. He is your everything. We've been rescued once when we got born again. Amen? Romans chapter 4. This really is the last one. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Yes. 
For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Mm -hmm. Verses 21 through 24. being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness praise the Lord now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead that rescue is a promise of glory to come in this world and in eternity yes. future. All promises of God in him are yea and in him. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But not one is possible or even preferable without the promise. Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Our promised land. Yes. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So Father, we just thank you again that, that we know you as our Father. Amen, that, that we have become one with you and that every good and perfect, perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no yes. variableness, no shadow of turning. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Always our Abba Father. Yes. And we praise you for it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great weekend. Happy Father's Day to all. Spend some good time with your family if you can. Sure, spend some time with your daddy God. Yeah. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>